skipping ahead a thousand years, philosophy changed uh, starting around 1500 in a rather deep way. How modern Western political philosophy has deviated from the red past has been at the center of debates for quite some time. The crisis of modernity by Leo Strauss, for example. So, while the topic itself is not new, this speech by Professor Sachs is of particular significance today because we are now witnessing how crisis unfold into catastrophe with the future fading into greater unknown. While Aristotle taught, for example, that politics is a field of ethics, Aristotle's book, The Politics, the first book of political science, it is paired with his ethics, Nicomachean ethics, as two joined volumes because for Aristotle, ethics and politics were the same. Are ethics and politics one and the same? To properly reflect on this proposition, we need to go further back. Two centuries earlier than Aristotle, Confucius had two famous definitions for politics. One, to engage in politics is to be virtuous. And two, politics is to establish correctness. It teaches that politics cannot exist in isolation of the judgment of good and evil, and the judgment of right and wrong. There is another reason why studying Confucius rather than Aristotle on the question of ethics and the politics is more relevant. Because Confucius was concerned with territorial states, with vast land and huge population, rather than the small city-states in Aristotle's vision. Machiavelli wrote a very different political science. He wrote a handbook for the prince which was about how to maintain power. And political science in the West began to be the science of maintaining or managing power, not the science of producing the good. Machiavelli was a man of the 15th to 16th century. His writings were far from scientific. So how is it that a few demagogic handbooks were able to change the course of evolution for Western political philosophy. The core of the problem lies in the innate deficiencies of the Western civilization as we know it today. According to German philosopher Karl Jaspers' theory of the Exo Age, four major civilizations of mankind in four distinct locations, roughly around the same time period between 900 to 200 BCE, all experienced a stage of spiritualization, a transcendence in human self-awareness. They are Confucianism and Taoism in China, Hinduism and Buddhism in India, Monotheism in Israel, and the philosophical rationalism in Greece. The whole of the humanity took a forward leap with the spiritual and the philosophical genesis. What we call today the modern Western culture is not what we are in the habit of calling Western civilization, which is the civilization that originated in Greece. Instead, it is a culture that emerged around the year 1000 in Northern Europe. It remained peripheral to the centers of the world civilization. It is a newborn culture and did not experience its own period of transcendence, the Exo Age, and with only limited contact with those great spiritual centers. It remained in a pre exo primitive state for a long time and did not fully gain the capability to sound moral and ethical judgment. Throughout the 15th and the 16th century, Western society as a whole still lived in the barbaric era with endless fighting between countless city-states and the tribes. And that's why the rulers would believe in Machiavelli's writings and find them of use. The fault is not on Machiavelli, 
But what is problematic is how Western society came to uncritical acceptance and the warm embrace of such political philosophy. Machiavellianism would not have gained prominence in any mature civilization that has experienced its actual age with ethical self-consciousness. As Carl Jasper put it, what is new about this age is that a man becomes conscious of being as a whole, of himself and his limitations. But in the West, men remained individualistic and insatiable, as that culture never realized the learnings of the actual age and that became the foundation to the popularity of Machiavellianism. Later in the next century, one of the most influential texts in Western cultural history was written by Thomas Hobbes, The Leviathan. And this was written in 1640 as Western science was taking shape. And Hobbes wanted a scientific theory of human beings, but modeled as individual atoms that collide with each other. Because for Hobbes, there was no longer a cultivation of virtue, but rather each individual with insatiable desires. So Hobbes's model of human nature is that it is simply unbounded desire. It can't be taught to moderate desire. It can't be cultivated for virtue. It is individualistic and it is insatiable. And so Hobbes said, unless there is an overarching power, people will kill each other. And so we need a Leviathan, he said, to stop human nature from committing non-stop violence. It was a very pessimistic view of human nature, but notice the main point is no longer was there any idea of developing virtue that was deemed to be impossible. Instead, one needed institutions to reflect harsh reality. This is the flip of philosophy. It's no longer about cultivating the good. It is about controlling the bad. Hobbes' doctrine is not at all new. His observations about human nature were seen in the writings by philosophers of ancient China. Guanzi lived in the 8th century BCE, more than 2,000 years before Hobbes. He too established a model of the real world based on the evils of human nature. In the article, King and the Ministers, he wrote, in ancient times, people were like beasts that lived in herds. They conquered each other with force. The wise deceived the foolish, the strong overpowered the weak, and the old, the young and the lone ones could not find their place. In the article Jin Cang, he wrote, Human nature, with the sight of profit, no one can avoid the seeking. With the sight of harm, no one can avoid escaping. Where interest lies, one will climb mountains of a thousand of feet high and die waters of a thousand of feet deep. This is exactly as what Hobbes and later Mandeville and others said. However, since ancient Chinese society already had a mature political culture and institutions, as early as Guanzi's time. The same observation on the human nature did not result in the same conclusions as Hobbes and others. Guanzi preached that there are four pillars to a civilized state. The sense of propriety, righteousness, honesty, and humility. Had all four pillars collapsed, the state would demise. It meant that in a civilized state, everyone was expected to understand the meaning of propriety, righteousness, honesty, and humility, and regulated their behaviors in accordance 
with a set of commonly respected norms. It would seem that this level of self-awareness and ethical self-regulation was unattainable for Western society. Not at the Hobbes time, and not now. Then interestingly, and importantly, this was amplified at the beginning of the 18th century, first by a very influential public intellectual, Bernard Mandeville, who wrote an essay in London called The Fable of the Bees. And in The Fable of the Bees, the most aggressive bees win, but they make the hive powerful and great. And if you try to control the avarice or the vice or the aggression of the bees, the hive actually dies. So this was now a philosophy of empire. Power seeking was good because it would make the society powerful and wealthy and able to dominate over the other bees. So it was taking Hobbes and adding another element. One beehive taking dominance over others. And clearly this was a philosophy that appealed to the emerging British Empire. Anything could happen in a society that has not experienced the spiritual transcendence of the Axial Age. There, it was a society that fed on people's insatiable desires instead of trying to cultivate virtues in human. The avarice or the wise of men were provoked as the source of power for a society to further its conquest of others. This would not be tolerated in a civilized society freed from barbarism. Let's take a look at ancient China for an example. Confucius placed great importance on the role of education. Giving no mention to the good or evil of human nature, he believed that the people are shaped by what they learn. He said people should be led by virtues and regulated by the rules of propriety. Xunzi, on the other hand, believed in the evil bodily nature of human. He said if driven by nature and guided by impulses, people will be trapped in struggles and scrambles. So, he suggested that a system of propriety and righteousness should be established in order to set respective boundaries. These are examples of how in a civilized society, intellectuals would bear the responsibilities of safeguarding a just society. They will never provide justification for actions that allow unbounded desires and unlimited power-seeking behavior. Then came Adam Smith six decades later in 1776, and he said in agreement with Hobbes and in agreement with Mandeville that human nature is individualistic, tastes are unbounded, desire is a great motivator, but market forces will tame all of that because market forces will force a kind of competition that will lead to a socially beneficent outcome. In stark contrast to Adam Smith, Xunzi said people are born with desires. Unsatisfied desires lead to quests. For such quests observe no boundaries or measures of a portion. It will necessarily result in contention. Contention leads to chaos, and chaos ends in poverty. So why did Xunzi think that contentious engagements between people will end in poverty? Well, Mandeville and Adam Smith believe that competition will generate a market order and an eventual socially beneficent outcome. The difference is fundamental. It is a matter of worldviews. Although Xunzi lived 2,000 years before Adam Smith, what he meant by people is the people of the world in its entirety, not a small group of individuals. In contrast, both Mandeville's hive 
and Adam Smith's nation refer only to a small political entity by which their visions were constrained. For small peripheral barbaric and backward polity, acquiring competitive power for overseas conquest and war was the only shortcut to quick riches. But for the world as a whole, mutual cooperation between peoples and nations is the only right path to long-term prosperity. The point is the Anglo-Saxon philosophy broke free of more than 1,800 years of Western tradition. The Western tradition from Aristotle and Christianity was a tradition of the common good, virtue, and care for the poor. With the rise of the British Empire, the philosophy became the benefits of power as a philosophy. And then even the idea that this would lead to, quote, the common good. But there are two more steps that are important to state. The poor became an enemy because now they were a drag on society. So John Locke, one of our most esteemed philosophers, wanted very harsh treatment for the poor so that they would not be burdens on society. And then came Malthus. Thomas Malthus wrote after Adam Smith, one generation later in 1798. And he proposed something even darker which is that those hives, those different societies, are actually in competition for survival with each other because there are more people produced than can be supported. And so life is a battle for survival. And trying to help the poor is inevitably to fail because there will just be more poor people. That was his iron law of population. That led in the next step Darwin took that idea brilliantly from a scientific point of view to understand natural selection, but the later 19th century philosophers took that idea as a struggle across nations, and that now nations or peoples or races were in the struggle for survival. And this became known as social Darwinism. And this is the root cause of why the world is in a crisis today. The recognition of social Darwinism as a science has meant that humanity was now on a path to total destruction. If we look at the history of the British Empire, its imperialist expansion has brought distinctions to wherever it landed, wiping out large populations countless ethnic groups, aboriginal civilizations, and the linguistic families. The exploitative and the destructive forces would bring down ecosystems of human civilization and of nature, and eventually of the imperial power itself. Notably, the U.S. The U.S. Empire is an extension of the British imperial establishment, but it has further involved in its capacity to exploit and destroy, with now the ability to end human existence in a split second, literally. The history of the Anglo-Saxon empires played out exactly as social Darwinism would have it as a material economy and scientific innovations thrived for the imperial establishment, so did the level of destruction at an accelerating rate in the race towards imminent ecological catastrophe and societal crisis. The fact that if you provoke limitless greed in man, this was always going to be the outcome. Wisdom from the Axel Age would have seen it from ancient time. And this gave rise to the worst crimes of history, because Nazism actually is a philosophy, which it was, based on social Darwinist pseudoscience, 
and this idea the German people will survive or the Slavic people will survive. And so this is a war even to extermination. Now this kind of idea led to the worst cruelties, but we are still in a mindset in the Western world where it is competition and struggle that is the absolute underpinning of society. This is the true face of what has been in the guiding philosophy for Western development. But we don't have to look as far as Nazism to see this. Crimes committed by Anglo-Saxon imperialism of recent times are no less atrocious. Norm Chomsky and Andrew Welchek have cited that between 50 to 55 million people have died around the world as a result of Western colonialism and neoliberalism since the end of World War II. Most of these murders were performed by the United States, justified under the name of freedom and democracy. This notion of letting greed motivate action perhaps did generate the spirit of innovation to some extent, but the way that it was championed and taught of course led to the worst excesses. So the world became rich and those who were rich became devoid of benevolence and compassion. Mencius is a Confucius philosopher of 300 BCE in ancient time, who believed in the four essences of human nature that are common to all. A heart of compassion, a sense of shame and guilt, a faculty of reverence, and a judgment of right and wrong. Suppressing these virtues in man is a precondition to the proliferation of Western liberal capitalism. And in turn, philosophical writings in the West glorified selfishness and greed under the names of freedom and competition. I believe we've had a deviation from the right path in Western civilization. There are roots of Western culture that we can really use to find a path of virtue and politics that is ethical. But the Anglo-Saxon version deeply lost this tradition. And there are many fascinating reasons for this, but it was mainly the rise of power of the British Empire, which was in many ways an extremely nasty empire. And the United States learned everything it knows from the British Empire because it aims to be the continuation of the British Empire after World War II. And this is what needs to end, a world that can return to the common ethical principles of virtue. Professor Jeffrey Sachs' reminders are as insightful and valuable as they are rare coming from a contemporary Western thinker. He laid out the trajectory of this great deviation from Machiavelli to Hobbes, Mandeville, Adam Smith, Malthus, Darwin, and finally to the author of The Virtue of Selfishness of Ayn Rand. But let's look at this from another perspective. This was never about the West losing its past and the drift away from its rules in the great ancient Greek civilization. Instead, the West as we know it today is a new culture that has never experienced the spiritual and the intellectual transcendence of the actual age and regressed backwards to the primitive times of before it. Humanity's quest to realize higher forms of existence was always going to be an ongoing journey of tests and choices. We are at the crossroad today. Do we stand by our aspiration 
to a society guided by workers, or do we collectively condone a red race to the button to assure the destruction? The future still holds boundless possibilities. World history is not the history of the West. Confucius pointed out more than 2,500 years ago, a just cause should be pursued for the common good. Today's world is challenged by the ethical regression instigated by the West. It is the same ultimate question today as it was at the time of Confucius. Should the world exist for all by ways of the common good, or should the world exist for the few by ways of each for themselves? Thank you.